Uh, happy Sabbath, everyone. Hey, good to see all of you guys here. Um, especially with uh, the whole coronavirus uh, impacting, I think, a lot of us. Uh, the fact that you guys are even here, uh, we're very thankful that you could, uh, and privileged that you can join us today. A couple of up updates as far as what our church is trying to do. Uh, the first thing is we are going to have a board meeting uh, today with all the board members, and we're going to decide what we're going to do as a church, uh, what are some guidelines that we're going to set as well. Okay, so we will be giving you guys some other updates as well as things go along. Okay, um, one of the things I wanted to talk about as far as uh, coronavirus was concerned, I know that a lot of uh, different people are reacting in different ways. Okay, uh, some of you guys and some people that you know uh, may be uh, dealing with this with incredible amount of fear. And some of you guys might be going through this and saying, what's the big deal? Like, everybody needs to calm down. Why, why this whole big mess? Um, I'm not going to tell you how to react because everybody reacts differently. And everybody deals with fear differently as well. But I think one thing we can do together as a church, okay, because we cannot help if we get virus or if things happen or fear comes. That we cannot choose. But we can decide whether, how we're going to treat one another, okay? Because I know it's really easy, okay, to people, if you're not fearing, to look at people who are fearing and say, you guys are overreacting and point fingers. And the other way around, where we say to people who are not fearing, they go, why are you guys so insensitive? But one thing we can do together as a church, okay, is we can decide, okay, all together to say, hey, we're reacting differently. Okay, let's not get, let's not point fingers, and yet, and instead, let's try to love one another better, and understand each other better. Because already, okay, outside of the world, and the world that we live in, it's already scattered, it's already point fingers, it's already your fault, this fault, all of these things. But at least together as a church, we want to say, hey, okay, we deal with things differently, but one thing we can decide to do together is to say, hey, let us still embrace one another and understand one another. So today, uh, last week we actually started a new series uh, called Vision 2020, but I realized with all the fear that's going on, I needed to actually uh, talk about this directly. So for maybe one or two weeks, we're going to actually talk about fear specifically. Because if you look at a lot of the different like news, uh, social media, they're telling us different ways of dealing with fear, okay? And because of coronavirus, our life, personal lives, work life, it has changed dramatically for us. And because of that, there's a lot of discussion that's going on. Okay, some people, again, there's extremes, right? Some people say, what are you doing? You're not preparing enough. You need to do this, this, this. And there's the other extreme where they say, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. Okay, just do positive thinking. Okay, don't worry about this. Kind of like what Trump says, it's miraculous, miraculously just going to go away. Don't worry about it. So today, we're going to actually say, okay, let's join in on that discussion. And let's actually see what the Bible has to actually say about dealing with fear. Or as Christians, okay, what is the approach? What is the perspective? And some of you guys might not be Christians. And some of you guys are different places in your faith walk. But regardless, this is just saying, hey, this is just one of the views of how to actually deal with fear. And so you guys check it out to see, hey, is this something that's going to be really helpful to my life? Okay, that's what we're going over. Today, we're going to be going over a guy named Paul. Now, Paul, you really need to listen to Paul and what he has to say about fear. Why? Not because he's in the Bible, but because this guy literally went through everything bad that could happen in life, like literally, okay? This is what he says. Oh, sorry. This is what he says. Tonight, a team of investors. Okay, I'll control it. Or is it, is, am I controlling it? Yeah, sorry, this, this sometimes like clicks a lot. Okay, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. So he's saying I've been whipped four times. 
Three times I've been beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent night and day in the open sea. Okay, I'm pretty sure none of us combined here has gone through what this man has gone through. So talk about fear. Talk about difficult time. This guy knows what he's talking about. He con- but it doesn't stop there. He continues on. He says this. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, dangers from bandits, dangers from my fellow Jew- Jews, dangers from Gentiles, in the city, in the country, in the sea, from false people. What is he saying? He's saying, everybody hates me, basically. And everywhere I go, there's fear. He doesn't stop there. He continues on. I have labored, toiled, often gone without sleep. I have known hunger, thirst, have gone often without food, and have been cold and naked. So literally, this guy has been through everything. And now this guy is going to say something to us, because a lot of us are in fear or dealing with difficult situation, even if it's not coronavirus. Some of you guys, in your personal life, in your relational life, you guys are going through a difficult time. What he's saying is, hey, there's a principle or there's something that's going to help you to stay afloat. Because this guy says, I've been through everything. Okay? And I have survived. So he's going to share our word of wisdom to us. So what can we learn? This is what he says. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. By the way, he's writing this in a jail. Okay? Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Again, if you just read this, just like, just read this, you'd be like, wow. This is a person who has probably never gone through a difficult time in his life. Right? Like, yeah, rejoice always. Easy for you to say, dude. Do you know what I'm going through? But again, because we have context of what this guy actually went through, then we go, oh, What's wrong with this guy? Okay, so there's two things we could, we could just uh, we could think about. One is, maybe he just likes pain. You know, like those weird people, like crazy people, they're just like, yeah, pain, I love it. Hey, is that what he's going through? Or perhaps he knows something, he has a secret, or he has a principle, okay, where he can stay poised, or he can stay calm, he can stay gentle, Okay? He doesn't become sensitive. He doesn't become bitter. And yet he has this equilibrium where he's able to go through the difficult times and the fears in his life where he actually says, okay, don't be anxious about anything. Okay? Is that possible? Well, let's see what he says. Okay? How do we actually have this kind of a thing? Okay? So let's see what he says. This is what he says. Uh, He says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Jesus Christ. So he says, hey, the reason why I'm able to do this is because I am a Christian. I believe in Jesus. Okay, let's continue on. This is what he says. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Okay, so obviously from this context, we see it's not option one. He's not just this crazy guy who like came out of the wound and said, you know what, nothing phases me. Okay, he's not like emotionless. What does he actually say? He says, I have actually learned this. So what does that tell Every single one of us in here. Okay. We talked about it during Enneagram. Some of us just are more anxious than others. And some of us are just more chill than others. But he doesn't say that, right? He doesn't say, I was born this way. I'm a nine. So I'm just just chill about everything. Whatever. Coronavirus gets me. He doesn't say that. 
he says, this is something I have learned. So that's good news for each and every one of us in here, whether you are fearing or not fearing, okay? because one day there will be some kind of fear that will get to us, even if you're not fearing about the coronavirus. What this is telling us is this is something that we can learn. This is not just something for spiritual people. This is not just something for more mature people. No, this is something each and every one of us can actually grasp. And that's exciting. Okay, that's really cool because really Paul's life, if you look at it, uh, one of the words I describe his life is buoyancy, right? Like this life jacket, okay? It never, never sinks, okay? There could be a crazy storm, okay? Life can be crazy, windy, no matter what goes on, it never goes down. It just stays afloat, okay? How about we all together, how, how can we have that? Is that possible even through this crazy coronavirus or even with all the other craziness that we have to deal with life? Is it possible for us okay, to not get cynical about life and just say, oh, whatever? On the other hand, to drown in fear, but instead come to a place where we can stay afloat. This is exactly what Paul's offering to us. This is what he says. Okay, let's get Let's analyze. There's two things he says. Well, there's a lot of things he says, but let's focus on the two things that he specifically tells us to do to stay afloat, to have buoyancy in our life, to stay poised. Poise. All right, two things. Uh, by the way, I gave this sermon uh, when we did uh, the Fruit of the Spirit. Uh, so a lot of you guys, it's going to be a review for you, but again, it's going to be a good review because, again, right now, the fear, for some of you guys, it's very personal, okay? The two things that we need to think about is thinking and thinking, okay? Both starts with TH, right? Easy to remember. Thinking and thinking. Okay, let's see. The first thing we need to learn, he says this. Brothers and sisters, this is how you have equilibrium. This is how you stay poised. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is, whatever is right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what does he say? Think about such things. Okay? What is he talking about? Okay? In this context, okay, Paul is talking about, okay, when you are going through fear, you need to think about the big things in life, the big questions in life, with the capital B. Hey, what are those questions? For example, what's the purpose of my life? Hey, where do I come from? Okay, what's right or wrong? Why am I grinding? Why am I living? After I die, what's going to happen to me? Hey, why is this world in a messy place? He's basically saying, talk about, think about, Big things, the things that are true, noble, right, pure. Think about the big questions in life. Okay? Now, most of you guys are going to say, and most of the uh, uh, self-help books, okay, most of other religions are going to say, no, 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 no. What are you talking about? Okay, Paul, I can't think about big things right now. I have all of these worries. I have my relationship with Sam. It isn't shamble. My finance is not good. Pa Where am I from? Purpose and life. What? Why should I worry about that? Why should I think about that? All right? If you go to any of the, the uh, self-help books, a lot of them are going to say, no, don't think about these things. They actually say the, the reason why you have so much anxiety and stress in your life is because you're thinking about all of these things that don't really matter. Okay, like the big questions in life. Don't worry about that. Instead, what do they talk about? They talk about, hey, calming techniques, soothing techniques, how to empty everything. Okay? You have all of these worries. What do you do? Take it out. Empty yourself. You know, like especially now, meditation is really, really big. Okay? If you say, people are like, even like 20 years ago, if you said, I meditate, people will be like, but now it's like, you meditate? Oh, that's really cool, man. 
So a lot of people, they meditate. Why? They, they say, hey, you got to empty your mind. You have all of these different stresses. Just empty them and then release them. Okay? So when they read such things as this, like Paul saying, no, you need to think, they go, whoa, 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 whoa. So what's the problem with just emptying yourself and detaching yourself? The problem is, is that the problem, just because you think you forgot about it, that doesn't mean that just the problem is gone, right? There's a, there's a long time ago, there was a movie like, um, what's that guy with the mustache? Uh, Chaplin? No, Charlie Chaplin, right? There was, there was like a, you know, like he didn't speak, but there was a, there was a, there was like a, one of those like short film where he was chained to a, you know, ball, like a, like a ball, okay, big like ball, okay? And he couldn't get out. So what he started doing was he started digging into the ground. And then he put his uh, metal ball that he was chained to onto the ground and he covered it up. And he says, oh, good. Now my problem is gone. And then he tries to walk away, of course, he falls down. But this is exactly what we're doing. This is exactly what they're suggesting. Is hey, empty your mind of these things. Don't worry about these things. Miraculously, they'll just float away. But the problem is, when did that ever solve your problems? When did your relationship ever get better by you forgetting about it? Oh, my, my husband never spends, you know what? Just let it go. I'm going to be okay. Uh, did that make your relationship with your wife or husband better? No, if anything, you became more bitter. If anything, you became more indifferent. When did your finances get better by saying, oh, you know what? I'm just not going to think about it. I'm, let's just spend it. When did finances ever got better because of that? Never. So again, maybe immediately it makes us feel good, but we realize this doesn't actually solve the problem. If anything, it actually makes it worse. And that's why parents in here, you guys tell your kids, deal with your issues. If you try to run away, if you try to hide it, if you try to lie about it, it's not going to solve anything. So that's why Paul says, hey, think about the big things in life. Now, now we go back to Paul then. Okay, Paul, how is thinking about life, destiny, purpose, meaning, how are those things going to actually help me? We have coronavirus coming out. How is that going to help me? How, how, how is me thinking about these metaphysical or philosophical thoughts, how are those things going to help me? Okay, well, let me tell you exactly how it's going to help you. Okay, this is what Paul says. Okay, think about, think about Christianity, okay? What is Christianity? Christianity basically tells us this, okay? There is a God, and he created us, okay, with the intention of a great artist, okay? This great lover who wanted to share his love, and that's why he created us, to enjoy in that love a world without pain, world without death, world without suffering. But the human beings decided, no, 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 God, I know you have this plan for me, but I think that's not happiness. I want something bigger, better. I want to be actually in control of my own life. And so they did it to say, you know what, God, I know you gave us this big earth to cultivate and to take care of, but you know what? I'm going to do it my way. And because of that, what started coming up was suffering and death and diseases. But this God, even though uh, his creatures have rebelled against him and have failed him and have betrayed him, this God, instead, starts, uh, instead of just killing all of them, he actually says, you know what? I'm going to actually run after these people who actually betrayed me, who actually cheated on me. So he says, I'm going to send my son to die for you. So you don't have to be in guilt. You don't have to be in shame. 
and that he's going to come back and he's going to take us or he's going to make all of this, this, everything, death, all of these coronavirus, all of these things, he's going to basically wipe it away and that we will live eternally with him again. Okay. Now, how does that help us? How does that impact us? Everything. Everything. Why? Because even though we are living in this extremely difficult situation, we know as Christians that it's always going to end well for us. That even though this world seems so hopeless, there is always hope for us. The worst thing that can happen right now is for you to, con for you to get coronavirus. And you know what's going to happen? Everybody will run away from you. But Christians, you can be sure that even though everybody, even your family, will run away from you, there is one person that is going to be running towards you. So as you're going through pain, as you're going through suffering, as you're going through fear, you need to think about that. Some of you guys, you're living your life and you feel like life is purposeless. Maybe because of your circumstances. Maybe because of the futility of the life that we live. And you go, life sucks. I'm indifferent to everything. And you become so cynical. If you think about these things, that God actually has given you meaning, that you do have a purpose here, and that there is a future for you, that's going to change things in your life. The alternative is this. This is one of, uh, um, he's, a, he's a professor of uh, biology. He, he, he died recently. Uh, Cornell University, this is what he says. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tell us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. This is no life after death. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, meaning, and life. And no free will for human beings either. Okay? This is why people don't think. This is why, if you're not a Christian, you shouldn't think. Because it's really, really depressing. But as Christians, you need to think about the big things in life, the big picture in life. Why? Because these are the things that's going to hold us steady. When things are hard, you have to see that there is hope. You have to see that coronavirus is not the end. That cancer is not the end. That there is actually life afterwards. That the life that we're living, the interaction that we have, is meaningful. That the things that we do matter. This is why Paul is calling us to think. Think about the big things in life. When you are going, I know, it seems crazy, I know. Because when you are going, again, when you're in the sea and things are going crazy, you can't think. You just want to say, I want to relax, 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 relax. But what he's actually telling us is, as you're holding on to your raft, think. This is not, this is not, life is not just over by this. There is so much more. There is meaning. There is purpose. There is a reason why you're here. There is hope. Second thing he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Okay, so the first thing we talked about, how did he stay so buoyant through the times of fear? The first thing was thinking. And the second formula he gives is thinking. Okay, as you are praying, Pray with thanksgiving. Now, most of us, even Christians in here, we don't do this. Okay? What I mean by that is, this is how we operate in prayer. We say, God, there's this thing that I want. 
if you do these things that I want, then I'm going to thank you. Okay? I want a wife. Wife, thank you. Okay? Money situation, oh, money comes. Thank you. Okay? This is how we operate. But Paul doesn't say that here, right? Paul doesn't say, okay, pray, and then wait for it. Good thing, oh, thank you. He doesn't say that, right? He says, as you are requesting, making your request, thank God at the same time. Okay, why? Why does he tell us to do that? It's because Paul is basically telling us, hey, we need to trust God, okay, while we are praying. So that no matter what circumstances, no matter what situation comes about us, we can still have faith that God is a good God. Okay? No matter what circumstances come, I know that God is a good God. And that never changes. Even if I don't get a wife, even if my finances don't work, even if I get coronavirus, I can still say, God is good. This is what Paul says in another letter. He says, because why? We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who has been called according to his purpose. This is why we can say God is good. This, you see, this is why, even though we're going through difficult times in our relationship, or in our finances, or even parenting, okay, even coronavirus, diseases, we can still thank God. Why? Because God, in the end, can still bring goodness out of bad situations. And that's why Paul is saying, I can still thank God. Now, you have to be very careful here. What Paul isn't saying is, God is purposely giving you painful situation. He's purposely giving you coronavirus so that he can bring goodness out of it. That's not what he's saying, right? He's saying, even amidst all of the terrible things, the sins, the flaws, the mistakes that we make, we still know that God can bring goodness out of our pitiful situation. And if you believe that, that's what's really going to keep your buoyancy. Because you know what's going to happen if you don't hold on to God? What you're going to hold on to are people or yourself or the world. But the thing is, as you guys know from experience, as you grow older and older, sadly, the, our experiences have already told us, our family, the world, even government, even ourselves, we fail our own standards. We keep failing ourselves. And so what's going to happen is because we, we held on to a foundation that wasn't firm, we will always be shaken. But what is this telling us? This is telling us in every situation, we can still thank God. Of course, we do still ask, God, help me with this. Please, God, give me this. Right? It does, Paul said prayer and petition, but also you have to thank God at the same time, knowing that he will bring goodness out of the situation. So two things he tells us. When we're in time of fear and troubles, we need to be thinking and thanking God. Now, I want to specifically talk to the Christians in here. Okay? Once again, if you're not a Christian, we're so thankful you're here with us and that you listen to this. And you can, hey, hey again, you can check out whether this works or not in your life. Just try it. If it doesn't work, then it's all good, right? But specifically for Christians, let me talk to you guys. For Christians, you need to really think about, right now, a question you need to think about is, why am I not experiencing this kind of peace that Paul is talking about? Okay, once again, Christians, you need to think about, why am I not experiencing this equilibrium? Okay, whatever extreme you're on, if you're on the extreme of, I'm drowning right now. I feel so overwhelmed. Or on the other stream, you're going, whatever, I'm indifferent. I'm cynical. This world had me. I'm done. 
What Paul is asking you as Christians, how come you're not experiencing peace? Paul's answer to that would be, it's because you are not thinking. It's because you want stupid peace. Meaning, like this miraculous peace where you go, God, just take me, take this away. That's what you want. You want fairy tale stuff. Where God just changes everything and you go, God, I'm done. That's good. Thank you, God. I'm out. You want the stupid kind of peace. You want the very small type of joy. And you're not thinking enough. What Paul is asking for you to do, okay, for you to have smart peace in your life. To think about these things. Again, if this world was hopeless, then absolutely be in a hopeless situation. But Paul is saying, you are not hopeless. There is hope. Things are going to end well. Disease is not over. So Christians, you need to be thinking. And you need to be thinking. Let me share one story, and then we'll close up. I'll give you a live example of someone who's actually thinking and thinking. There was a man named Horatio Stafford uh, in late 1700s, okay, about 1780. He was living in Chicago. He was an American. He was a lawyer. Very, he was doing very, very well. But uh, one of his younger son actually died of pneumonia that year. But after that, there was a great fire in Chicago. I don't know if some of you guys know history. Um, uh, or learned this from your history classes, there was a big, big fire in Chicago where it wiped out a lot, uh, lot of it, and his practice was one of them. So he lost his son, okay? and the same year, he lost basically his whole asset. A couple of years passes, and he says, honey, to his wife and his four daughters, he says, this is crazy. Okay? Like, life has been crazy for us, Let's go, on a, let's go on a vacation to Europe. Okay? So they buy a ticket. But on the day uh, that they're supposed to go to Europe, uh, he had to do, like, a business thing came up, and he had to stay. He couldn't go. So he said to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the wife and the daughters, you guys go first. Okay? He goes. Uh, uh, they, they, they start going, and then he says, I'll follow you guys afterwards. He, they go. He finds out later. Okay, that ship, okay, they hit an uh, ice, and because of that, right, basically, the sh it was shipwrecked. So he's thinking for weeks and weeks what's going on. Finally, after a couple of weeks, he gets a telegram from his wife. It said, survived alone. What do I do? Okay, basically, four of his daughters all died. He gets on a boat to, to his wife, to get to uh, Europe, to get, get to his wife. As he's going there, literally this man has lost everything. Okay, literally everything. He lost all his assets. He lost all of his kids. But he started thinking. Okay, he didn't say soothing techniques. He didn't say you know what, this is life, whatever, I don't care. Indifferent. He didn't say that. He started thinking about the big things in life. What's the purpose of life? Why am I here? Why did Jesus come on this earth? And that actually started to give him peace. This crazy, crazy peace that he thought he could never have. He started to experience peace. And a tune started coming into my, his mind. Okay? And so he wrote a song. And it's a song that all of us, we know very well, and we're going to sing at the end, which is, It Is Well. He's the guy who wrote It Is Well. He says, It Is Well, It Is Well. When things are crazy, It Is Well, It Is Well, It Is Well with my soul. Again, this is not a crazy man. He's not because nothing bad happened. No. Everything bad could have happened in his life. But because of the thinking and thanking God, 
he was able to have buoyancy. And he was able to inspire so many people to still be able to say it as well in the circumstances of craziness. So I invite you, whether you're a Christian or not, I invite you to be able to say it as well by thinking and thinking to God in this time of craziness. Let's go into time of reflection.